Skyrim and The Witcher 3 are two of the biggest, most popular open-world action-adventure RPGs ever created. Both of these games set a new standard for the genre when they were released in 2011 and 2015, with absurdly high metascores clocking in at 94 and 93 respectively. I was not as enamored with either of these games as the general public was, despite having a strong affinity for and appreciation of open-world RPGs. I had a lot of negative criticism to level against Skyrim, and even while praising The Witcher 3 rather extensively, I felt like it, too, had a lot of issues that seriously diluted and detracted from the experience. Both games are top-notch AAA productions with excellent presentation and smooth, accessible gameplay that ultimately felt lacking in meaningful depth. Enter Elix, the science fantasy post-apocalypse RPG from Piranha Bytes, the small German studio behind the Gothic and Risen series. On a surface level, it's actually much worse than either Skyrim or The Witcher 3, largely due to production limitations of being a much smaller studio, about 30 people as opposed to hundreds, with a much smaller budget, about $2 million versus nearly $100 million. There's a distinct lack of polish across almost every aspect of the game, which on first impression can make it seem like a thoroughly mediocre, undesirable experience. But if you can get past these surface layer blemishes, there's a surprisingly deep, rich, and rewarding gameplay experience to discover. By no means is Elix a perfect game, but I honestly feel like it's better than both Skyrim and The Witcher 3 in some of the areas that matter most to me when it comes to open-world action-adventure RPGs. Before getting any further, I need to make a few disclaimers. Obviously, I'm not saying that Elix is universally better than Skyrim or The Witcher 3. Point of fact, both of those games have plenty of things of their own that they do better than Elix, which might make them vastly more appealing games to certain people. For example, Skyrim is much better at allowing open-ended, sandbox-style role-playing, complete with full-on character creation, and also has an incredible modding community to custom-tailor the experience to your personal liking while The Witcher 3 offers a much more compelling narrative presentation with regards to its quests, stories, and characters, alongside top-notch production quality to name just a few of the big examples. I'm just saying Elix does certain individual things better. Some of this is subjective in terms of what I want out of the games I play and what I personally consider to be more fun and engaging gameplay designs, while other things are a little more objective in terms of what I would consider to be deeper and more complex, and thus arguably better, mechanical systems. Although I'm going to be criticizing both Skyrim and The Witcher 3, the point is not to disparage or ridicule those games, but rather to illustrate stylistic differences in execution to better demonstrate some of Elix's more notable design aspects for which I feel it doesn't get enough credit. Although I'm not a huge fan of either Skyrim or The Witcher 3, I still respect them for what they are and have enjoyed playing them, generally speaking, and likewise don't begrudge anyone else who enjoys them. As such, I'm not trying to tell anyone to stop liking those other games and like this other game instead. My intention is simply to show an alternative perspective for how games can be designed a little differently and why those designs might be more appealing designs to certain people. As I alluded in the introduction, I'm also not trying to claim Elix as some kind of flawless masterpiece, as the whole game is rife with technical shortcomings and questionable design choices that leave it feeling inconsistent and even pretty frustrating, if not outright disappointing at times. After all, I have two entire videos where I go into detail describing things the developers' previous games did better and things I'd like to see improved in the sequel. Even some of the things I'm about to praise in this video come with an asterisk acknowledging inherent faults in the system. But flawed as the game may be, I still found it a deeply engrossing experience that was far more compelling than Skyrim, The Witcher 3, or any of Piranha Bytes' other recent games. Finally, I'm going to be making a lot of generalizations and simplifications about all three games, which doesn't necessarily mean those statements are 100% true 100% of the time, but that they apply in the majority of cases or in a general sense. There are always exceptions, of course, and I'll point some of those out if I feel they're notable enough, but I want this video to be more of a basic overview of what I consider to be Elix's relative strengths as opposed to a meticulous examination of all the nitty-gritty details from all three games. If you'd like to know more of my thoughts on Skyrim and The Witcher 3, then I'd suggest checking out my full reviews for those games, which go into more detail than I do here. Both Skyrim and The Witcher 3 suffer from icon hunting exploration, the kind of deal where their massive open worlds are filled with mostly empty space and you simply wander around waiting for the next icon to pop up on your mini-map or compass. 
It's almost like the developers knew the worlds they created weren't going to be fun or interesting enough for it to be worth people's time to actually explore them in detail on their own, and thus implemented a sort of hand-holding shortcut system to help players more quickly and easily identify the areas of meaningful content worth seeking out. That certainly helps to cut out on some of the mindless tedium fruitlessly seeking out content in areas where there ultimately isn't any, but it really hurts the feeling of exploration and discovery when the game is specifically laying everything out for you and practically dragging you by the nose to every bit of its content, ensuring you won't miss anything en route to completing the game. You're not discovering things for yourself, you're going exactly where the game tells you. You can at least turn the undiscovered icons off in The Witcher 3, but it's not an ideal fix for the problem, because you're still left with the featureless, empty spaces between locations which causes you to spend more time looking for content than actively engaging in content. And I'm not sure the game was designed to be played that way, because there isn't a lot of guiding structure in the environments or quest directions to facilitate finding these locations on your own, except through aimless wandering and stumbling into them by random chance. Skyrim, in contrast, doesn't even give you the option to disable the compass, as Bethesda clearly considers it an integral and essential part of their design. Making matters worse is how The Witcher 3 litters your map with icons well in advance of you actually setting out to explore the world just by reading a notice board in town, or that so much of Skyrim's exploration is based on sending you into small, linear environments completely separated from the overworld map that all look and feel largely similar to one another, despite being technically unique. Elix doesn't bombard you with icons. The only icons it shows you are for the locations of merchants, skill trainers, and teleporter pads, but you have to find all of these things and interact with them before the map starts tracking them, and even then it's mostly for the sake of reference. The map shows you the full geography of the entire playable area, but it doesn't drag you by the nose to every single point of interest because it expects you to find things for yourself. There's not even a mini-map displayed in the HUD. It's just a radar screen with compass navigation to help orient yourself in the world and to signify the direction of enemy threats around you. So instead of staring at the mini-map following icons, you're looking around the actual world with your own eyes from your character's perspective and exploring on your own. Anytime you discover something fun and interesting, it's because you put in the work yourself, which makes it feel more rewarding, especially since other players are unlikely to find the same things you find because other players may not be as determined, clever, or observant as you are, and the game isn't going to tell them, hey, there's a thing over here you should come and see. Since the game isn't spoiling its discoveries by blatantly telegraphing them, there's a genuine sense of curiosity about what lies in wait in this world, and it's pretty satisfying every time you discover something. The game also does away with randomized, variable, or otherwise scaled loot which is often the case in Skyrim and The Witcher 3. Every item in the game has been rigorously hand-placed by the designers, which allows them to tailor a specific reward for a specific amount of challenge, thereby also creating unique and memorable experiences within the world with unique and memorable rewards. That shipwreck off the southern coast has a powerful ring you can equip if you can get to it and survive the radiation and strong mutants patrolling the area. But that tower overlooking the biodomes has a unique sniper rifle and a fun bit of environmental storytelling if you think to climb to the top of it. It's not just a case of, we need to put some special loot here because this is a special area, because these special areas really aren't that special. They feel like natural parts of the environment. Or you can sometimes predict where you might find good loot, you sometimes end up disappointed by finding nothing at all, or surprised when you find good loot in a place you didn't expect, and you always find little discoveries scattered about in ordinary locations. These range from powerful legendary weapons, to notes and audio logs detailing the events of the game's backstory, to basic supplies like potions and money, to amusing easter eggs. It's classic variable reinforcement, the very basis for why gambling is so addicting for people, because you never know what you'll encounter next, and that leads to genuine tension and excitement with every stimulus. But instead of the variable reward being something the game dictates for you, the variable reward is based on your actions, where you go at what times in the game, and what you do within it. A big part of Skyrim's marketing campaign was project director Todd Howard hyping up a supposed fact in interviews that you could climb any mountain you see. That mountain is not just a backdrop, you can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. Besides the fact that this was misleading, it wasn't really that fun because you were either following an intended path up the mountain or awkwardly flinging yourself against a collision mesh in defiance of the game's physics. Elix one-ups this entire concept by giving you a jetpack from the very beginning of the game, opening the entire game world up to you from all its peaks to all of its valleys. 
Most people will say with reverence when talking about open world games how much they love being able to see something on the horizon and then actually go there. Elix is one of the best in the game at this, second possibly only to Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, because a jetpack enables such a high degree of freedom of movement that you can go virtually everywhere you desire. The only places that are off limits are the edge of the game world and the mountains around the crater where the comet hit. And unlike The Witcher 3's mostly flat maps with limited draw distances, where your line of sight is constantly blocked by trees and shallow hills, Elix has a ton of verticality in its world, which gives you a lot of vantage points to see long distances across the maps so that you can pinpoint interesting areas to explore on your own. That also makes the world feel more complex with a lot more hidden areas and more meaningful exploration, since you're not just exploring on a two-dimensional plane of left, right, forward, and backward, but also up and down. It is, literally and figuratively, a much deeper world. The quests in Skyrim and The Witcher 3 are generally both mindless affairs of following the dotted line and pressing the action button on the appropriate things. Skyrim's radiant quest system generates an infinite number of random objectives to find random things from random enemies from random locations which strips nearly all narrative purpose and significance from these side quests, making them feel quite obviously like tedious busy work where it feels like you're always just mindlessly chasing after arrow icons the entire game. Its more important quests, like the main quests, guild quests, civil war quests, and also more developed side quests, likewise suffer from a general lack of player input, where it feels like you're on rails most of the time, and where rare opportunities to effect a decision feel largely irrelevant to your character's build or role-playing archetype. The Witcher 3's quests, meanwhile, rely too heavily on using Witcher senses to solve problems, where you essentially just press a button to highlight the solution and then follow the highlights to the conclusion while Geralt does all the thinking and problem solving himself. Its strong emphasis on the narrative storytelling also makes it feel like you're stuck following the script most of the time just so that you can make the quests and stories play out in the one specific way that the developer intended them to play out. As with the exploration, both games rely too heavily on simply following quest markers, and unfortunately you're kind of forced to just mindlessly follow the icons a lot of the time because there's no other information given to help you discover a location or figure out what to do on your own, thereby making them feel even more passively mindless. Quests in Elix aren't really that sophisticated, since the basic groundwork in most of them consists of the usual go here, kill this, fetch this, talk to this person, or deals, but they're not the blasé, straightforward affair that tends to cripple these kinds of quests. A lot of quests in Elix actually require you to listen to NPCs you're talking to, pay attention to what they're saying, and think about what you're doing, instead of just mindlessly following the quest markers. As an example of what I mean, the first town, Goliette, has a set of laws forbidding technology, and they have a place called the Pit where they throw all the technology they find. One of the town's leaders is very insistent on you adhering to these laws when you first meet him, and if you ask for work to prove yourself so that you can join his faction, he gives you a quest to retrieve a laser rifle from the guy in charge of managing the pit. This is actually a test to see how well you understand the laws and how well you follow them. If you treat it like a basic fetch quest and just show up at the guy's hut asking for the weapon, or if you just try to straight up steal it from him, then you'll fail the quest because you didn't question your orders. In the same town, you're tasked with checking in on some cultivators who are working the wildlands outside of town. One of the guys mentions that they're low on food supplies and haven't heard from town in a while. You can either report back to town and bring them a bunch of moldy bread, because the town has no food to spare and that's all they can offer, or collect 50 mushrooms for them. You might be tempted to give them the moldy bread, because you get the same amount of experience either way, and it saves you the trouble of rounding up all those mushrooms, or parting with your own supply which you may have already collected in your own adventures. But if you go this route, you later find out that they got food poisoning and couldn't work anymore, and the town leader gets upset with you. It's another basic fetch quest, but it requires you to think about what the possible consequences might be and act intelligently to get the best reward, or else you suffer the consequences. Can kill me fast enough, though. That is, if the animals didn't get me first, or I don't eat the wrong thing and get poisoned. As a running theme in Elix, most quests have two or three solutions with two or three outcomes, sometimes even allowing you to use your character's unique stats and skills to affect outcomes, something Skyrim and The Witcher 3 don't really do, seeing as those games generally limit their character-based decision-making to a single skill, like persuasion or delusion. 
Elix also uses a sort of role-playing karma system with the cold meter that measures Jax's emotional state over the course of the game, thereby opening up or closing off extra role-playing options in dialogue and how you're able to solve quests. In Elix, these different choices can lead to different bits of optional dialogue, extra rewards, and different outcomes, some of which can have lasting consequences and significant effects on the world. The previous examples in the Berserker Town, Goliath, are part of joining the Berserker faction. If you fail enough of these quests by making poor decisions, then you can actually become barred from joining the Berserkers or even trading with their merchants, at least not without paying a hefty penalty fee to smooth things over. In another town, if you lie to a major character, you might think he'd be none the wiser and you'd get away with it, but then he later kills another quest NPC just to get payback on you for lying to him, and then you can no longer proceed in that quest. One of the major towns, the Domed City, has a whole bunch of quests associated with it as different groups push their own agendas. Depending on whom you side with throughout all these quests, whole groups of people, or even the entire town itself, can get killed, thus eliminating certain service providers and quest givers from the world. With you having the opportunity to go around talking to the survivors and seeing how everyone reacts to the aftermath. How you resolve the main quest line can have huge ramifications for the post-game, with entire factions turning hostile on you. Compare this to Skyrim where you overthrow the Jarl of Whiterun in an epic set piece where the whole town is set on fire and you raid the castle. The battle itself feels dynamic and exciting, but then everything gets reset back to normal almost immediately afterward with no major changes and everyone seeming completely indifferent to the dramatic change of situation. Or where you assassinate the Emperor as part of the Dark Brotherhood questline and it seems to have no impact on the political spectrum of Skyrim's confrontation with the Imperial Legion, and no one seems to notice or care except for a few random offhand comments from random no-name guards. Compare this to The Witcher 3, where you decide to assassinate King Radovid and nothing really changes until the final end screen slide shows. No one even seems to comment on it or notice in-game, as various Redanian guards will continue to shout, Long live King Radovid, as if nothing ever happened. They give you choices that give you the illusion you're having an impact on the world, but they both tend to skimp on the actual consequences for your actions, as the outcomes are typically meaningless or purely superficial. In fairness, The Witcher 3 is actually pretty good with its choices and consequences, especially compared to Skyrim and most other games, but its variable outcomes are often limited to the scope of the one quest you're working on, like seeing a different ending in a choose-your-own-adventure book, not actually affecting the rest of the world beyond the scope of that one self-contained story. There is still some missed potential with Elix's quest design, most notably with the Domed City. Although it demonstrates a dramatic change of situation and allows you to feel the effects of the aftermath, once you reach that resolution the domed city becomes completely inert and obsolete. From that point onward it has no further involvement in the main quest and has no further side quest to offer with rebuilding the domed city or helping the survivors recover from the attack, which would have been prime opportunities to make the outcomes feel even more dynamic and impactful. We could maybe also argue that the Civil War quest in Skyrim have a similar effect on the world as Elix's Abessa conflict, with you unlocking different quest paths and generating different outcomes of the peace treaty, but I just never really felt like my decisions in the Civil War were having any significant impact on the world that I could actually feel or observe through actual gameplay, beyond a few fleeting, heavily scripted quest sequences. Unlike most of Piranha Bytes' older games, Elix also relies a little more on quest markers to indicate where you have to go, like when you need to find a rare plant that only grows in special locations. But fortunately that trend is not universally applied to its entire quest design, as there are others, like the one where you have to find plants scattered around the lake above Goliath, that you can figure out just through your own wits and observation skills, if you were to leave the quest markers deactivated and just go looking for the plants on your own. So while it's a step back from Gothic Arisen, I still find it better than Skyrim or The Witcher 3. Oblivion set a trend that nearly ruined progression systems in RPGs with its overzealous level scaling that ensured every single enemy in the game would be tailored to your level so that, no matter where you went or what you did, you'd always experience the same degree of challenge and difficulty. There's some merit to its intentions, but the system was ultimately so flawed that it ruined any feeling of accomplishment for getting stronger, because everything else got equally stronger with you. 
Unfortunately, Bethesda seemed to learn their lesson with subsequent games and scaled things back a bit, giving enemies and areas a limited range within which enemies can scale. But Skyrim still suffers from things like being able to kill dragons, which should be city-raising deadly end-of-the-world threats and endgame enemies right from the beginning of the game at level 1, and giants, which do in fact start the game 32 levels higher than you and are therefore rightly impossible to fight at level 1 just a few hours and a few levels later. As a matter of fact, you're going to spend the vast majority of your time in Skyrim fighting the same assortment of bandits, Draugr, and Falmer who are going to persistently scale up in level with you, gaining better stats and stronger equipment, thus making it feel like you're constantly doing the same thing the entire game. This is not even to mention the scaling loot that gives you randomized loot tailored for your level, such that it never really matters where you go or what you do, outside of things like finding word walls to learn shouts, because you'll always have essentially the same chance to find the same rewards everywhere you go. The game's loot progression rewards you more for how long you've been playing the game, instead of for any specific feat you've accomplished. The Witcher 3 is wise enough not to have any of its enemies scale down to your level, but it has a few major problems of its own when it comes to progression. Primarily, the amount of content in the game, and thus the total playtime, is disproportionate to the scale of the progression system. I originally played both Elix and The Witcher 3 on their respective hard modes, spending 100 hours and 130 hours in each playthrough respectively. It took maybe 20 hours in Elix before I felt like I could comfortably handle most of the weaker enemies, whereas I hit that mark in about 10 hours of The Witcher 3. I was maybe 70 hours into Elix by the time I felt like I could stand a reasonable chance against the toughest enemies, and I hit about that same mark in The Witcher 3 at around 40 hours. In other words, I hit a point in The Witcher 3 when leveling stopped feeling rewarding much sooner than I did in Elix, which is made doubly problematic by the fact that The Witcher 3 is ultimately a bigger and longer game than Elix. All the while I was killing enemies so vastly higher level than me that their level was displayed as a giant red skull icon, thus making the difficulty progression feel completely unnecessary, even in Death March difficulty, since leveling up and getting stronger wasn't unlocking access to new content or greater challenges, it just made what I was already doing a little faster. Secondly, The Witcher 3 scales quest rewards down as you level up if you go beyond their intended level range, which means you can reach a point when the game literally stops rewarding you for completing its quests, which is pretty much guaranteed to happen because you become overleveled so quickly from its huge abundance of content. Nothing in Elix scales to your level. All enemy types and strengths are present within the game world right from the start, meaning you can be fighting basic starter enemies or super strong endgame enemies right at level 1. Those high-level enemies can kill you in a single hit in most cases, and so it's up to you to figure out where you can go, what enemies you can fight, and to come up with your own strategies and techniques for staying alive and accomplishing your quest objectives. This places a strong impetus on getting stronger. Many of your quests and objectives seem impossibly daunting at the start of the game because of how weak you feel relative to the rest of the world. Leveling up, therefore, is not just a matter of introducing dynamically fun new gameplay elements, but is also a matter of mechanical necessity to overcome the game's incredibly tough difficulty. Elix doesn't hold your hand throughout any of this. It expects you to figure out for yourself what you can and can't do and solve your problems on your own. So when the game throws a tough challenge your way and you find some clever way around it, or you spend a dozen or more hours getting your butt kicked by certain enemies and finally reach a point when you can comfortably face them, it feels satisfying because it's something you accomplished on your own without the game's assistance. Elix makes you work for every reward. If you want to get stronger weapons and armor, for instance, you have to craft them yourself, which requires the right attributes and skills, plus a ton of money and resources, or find them in the world by exploring extremely dangerous areas, with better loot more likely to be found around more difficult challenges. The harder you push yourself, the greater the reward. Even when you do acquire these powerful items, they have really steep requirements to use that will take even more time and effort to equip. This challenge persists for nearly the entire game, so that there's always a reason you want to get stronger, and always some useful skill just out of reach. The game is extremely difficult up front, even on normal difficulty, because it's trying to create a more satisfying difficulty curve that rewards your growth and progression as a player character. So many other games go to great lengths to hold your hand by scaling enemies to your level or custom tailoring the world designs so that you only ever encounter beatable, low-level enemies in the starting area. 
with enemies getting progressively stronger the further you work your way out from the starting point, which makes leveling up and getting stronger feel like less of a necessity because you have fewer speed bumps and roadblocks to overcome, which in turn makes it less rewarding. If everything is designed to be a reasonable but winnable challenge when you first encounter it, then there's not much incentive to level up, and doing so ends up feeling less impactful because your growth as a player character just matches the rest of the game's growth and difficulty as you reach new areas and encounter new enemies. Elix, like other iconic Piranha Bytes games, makes the combat difficulty much harder up front and likes to mix high-level, nigh-unbeatable enemies into the starting area to accentuate the feeling of zero to hero that you get from being a level 1 scrub incapable of defeating anything in the world but the most basic enemies, to finally becoming a demigod wiping out hordes of the toughest enemies. By making it so difficult up front, it's meant to challenge you to think of alternative ways to explore the world and engage in its content, and by putting high-level enemies in the starting area, it adds more tension to the ordinary gameplay, because you never know what dangerous threats lie in wait around what corners, and thus have to be more cautious and deliberate about how you explore the world and complete quests. It's meant to feel rewarding when you come back later to fight enemies that were previously impossible, because it gives a more tangible and practical feeling of your character getting stronger while also opening up all new areas areas of exploration that were previously much too difficult for you to handle. Think of it like a typical underdog sports movie. The protagonist usually gets crushed by the main rival and similar competition in the opening scenes, and then through a rigorous process of training and practicing, they rise through the ranks and eventually come back to beat their rival at the end. Those types of stories are satisfying on a narrative and emotional level because the protagonist is challenged and has to overcome a steep obstacle, which they ultimately accomplish through their own grit and determination. The bigger the challenge, the more satisfying their victory at the end. In contrast, a sports movie where the protagonist beats the early competition and only has minor struggles towards winning the final tournament or whatever would be far less exciting and engaging of a story because there's less of a dynamic shift in the character or the situations, and there'd be no tension in seeing how the character will get out of difficult situations and overcome the next hurdle. Elix takes those narrative concepts and applies them directly to the gameplay, allowing you to personally feel the type of growth and satisfaction that an underdog sports movie protagonist experiences over the course of the story and gameplay, which is something that I personally really appreciate and find immensely more compelling than other, similar types of games where you're already a highly competent fighter from the beginning of the game and don't have to face that much challenge or adversity in reaching the end of the game. Combat in Skyrim and The Witcher 3 may look epic and exciting. After all, you're fighting dragons in Skyrim and doing a lot of fancy, elaborate sword moves in The Witcher 3, but they're not actually that sophisticated. Skyrim's combat feels archaically simple, the kind of deal where you basically just stand there clicking on an enemy until one of you dies, not all that different from the Elder Scrolls 1 arena way back in 1994, except without the randomized dice rolling, plus a few additional features like power attacks, manual blocking, and shouts, which are functionally identical to magic attacks. It has a stamina meter, but it has a minuscule effect on anything, and enemies barely react to being hit by a melee weapon, so it often feels like you're smacking a bag of potatoes. In The Witcher 3, almost every fight boils down to a simplistic, repetitive pattern of attack, attack, dodge, attack, attack, dodge against a bunch of similar enemies that behave more or less alike, robbing the entire system of any depth it would claim to have. Elix's combat is ostensibly identical to The Witcher 3's, since they both use the same combination of light attack, strong attack, block, dodge, and parry, with a third-person camera in a system that emphasizes timing your attacks and dodges to find openings in the opponent's attacks or to defensively avoid the enemy attacks. Elix has a few positively distinguishing features, however. A stamina meter that decreases every time you perform any action in combat except for basic movement and regenerates after you pause between actions. A combo meter that builds as you time your attacks, causing you to deal more damage as the meter increases. And special attacks that you can unleash once your combo meter reaches a certain threshold. The key difference with Elix is the stamina meter. With every attack, block, dodge, and parry consuming stamina, every single action you make has to be deliberate and well-timed. If you spam attacks too much, then you'll be out of stamina when it comes time to block or dodge an incoming attack, and if you're blocking or dodging too frequently, then you'll be too low on stamina to attack back when given an opportunity. Combat in Elix therefore requires a careful balance of offense and defense, with every action having some kind of consequence on how the rest of the fight will play out. 
You have to watch enemies closely and learn when they're going to attack so that you can block or dodge at just the right moment to avoid damage and minimize lost stamina, and you have to know exactly when to attack so that your hit will go through. You have to stay close enough to an enemy to be able to launch into a counterattack at any moment, yet far enough away that you have enough space to react when it comes time to dodge an attack. All the while you have to be mindful of your stamina meter, making sure you're consuming it wisely and making each of your actions count. Then you've got the combo meter, which increases your damage with each subsequent hit and allows you to execute a strong finisher attack once the combo is high enough. Building this combo meter requires that you time your attacks just right. Each time you click the mouse to attack, the meter will build throughout the length of the attack animation up until a certain point. If you click too early in the animation, then the meter will stop abruptly and give you less progress, and if you click too late, then the meter will reset to what it was before the attack and you'll have to wait for your character's attack animation to reset back to neutral before you can attack again, thus leaving you exposed for damage. If you go too long without attacking, your progress will start to deplete until it eventually reaches zero or until you attack again. As with the stamina meter, you have to be mindful of how and when you attack, making sure you're clicking on the right rhythm to build the combo meter as optimally as possible while waiting for the right opening with enough stamina so that you can hopefully pull off a full combo, and keeping your offense going just enough to keep the stamina meter from depleting. Compare this to Skyrim and The Witcher 3, both of which basically amount to mindless button mashing click fests. While both games have a stamina meter, neither one is anywhere near as consequential as Elix's. In Skyrim, stamina is really only used for sprinting, blocking, and power attacks, which are somewhat optional maneuvers, and in The Witcher 3, stamina is primarily used for casting magic. Neither game seems to reward you for stringing multiple attacks together, at least not without high-level skills, and neither game has any concern for nuanced timing since you can spam left-click with impunity. The only instance in which timing really matters is when blocking or dodging attacks, and in the case of The Witcher 3, enemies' health bars flash brightly before an attack, telling you, hey, you should block or dodge right now and you have nearly full invincibility while using the basic backwards dodge, which, again, you can practically spam with limited risk of taking any damage. So basically, in both games, you just spam left-click and then dodge when you see an enemy telegraph an attack, and in the case of Skyrim, if you take damage, you can pause the game and heal back up to full health in an instant, making you effectively invincible throughout the entire game as long as you have enough potions in your inventory and can survive the first hit. Likewise, in The Witcher 3, Geralt pops potions and blade oils instantly in the middle of a fight, even from the pause screen, thus reducing some of the tactical depth of the combat system. What's the point, for example, of giving blade oils a usage limit when you can reapply the oil an infinite number of times at zero consequence? At least the potions are limited by the toxicity system and how many you can have stocked at one time, which prevents you from spamming health potions indefinitely like in Skyrim, but the lack of animation time is still a stark contrast to Elix, where drinking a potion takes time to do so, where you have to space yourself appropriately and actively avoid damage, which you might not be able to do if you haven't been managing your stamina well before that moment. The net effect of things like the potion animations, stamina meter, timed attacks, combo system, and finisher moves, combined with the game's insanely tough difficulty curve, means that it takes more active effort and reactive decision making to do well in the combat system, thereby making each successful fight against a difficult opponent feel more rewarding. It's a similar philosophy for why people find the combat in Dark Souls so satisfying, because there's an expectation of player skill involved, where the game isn't going to hold your hand and ensure you're successful all the time. It's on you to master the game's systems and figure out how best to handle each situation you encounter. In comparison, Skyrim and The Witcher 3 are more concerned with being accessible and looking good than being mechanically deep or engaging. Those games make me feel like I'm just passively pressing buttons until everything dies, whereas Elix makes me feel like my inputs actually matter in whether I succeed or fail. The combat is far from perfect, however. The animations feel stiff, the overall flow of everything feels a little disjointed, the controls can be randomly unresponsive at times, the hitboxes are questionable at best, and the balancing is pretty erratic with certain weapons, skills, and items vastly overpowering other, similar options. It's pretty janky, in other words, so even though I compared it to Dark Souls earlier, it's nowhere near being on the same quality level as that series of games. 
Despite having some interesting and engaging design elements, the combat is arguably Elix's weakest aspect due to how rough and clunky it all feels in execution, but if you can get past those issues and get the hang of how everything works, there's a surprisingly deep and engaging system underneath that can prove immensely more satisfying and rewarding than the combat systems in either Skyrim or The Witcher 3. The main stories in Skyrim and The Witcher 3 both deal with preventing an end-of-the-world type of cataclysmic event. Either dragons or the wild hunter threatening to take over the realm and destroy all civilization as we know it, and you have to stop them. That's all fine and good for a video game plot, but it's not very good for an open-world game to have such a dire, pressing main story about preventing the end of the world when the player is not just able, but outright encouraged to ignore the main threat completely and spend all of his time focusing on utterly trivial, inconsequential things like fetching plants for a random person in town, or trying to become a tournament champion in a collectible card game. And frankly, the main storyline isn't that engaging in either one, as they mostly consist of boring busy work that either escalates way too quickly, as in Skyrim with you being revealed as a dragonborn, doing a few simple tasks and then slaying Alduin in the span of a few hours, or drags on way too long, as in The Witcher 3 with you spending 75% of the game on a wild goose chase looking for Ciri by doing a bunch of unrelated favors for unrelated people. So you must find Dudu in order to find Dandelion, with the aim of ultimately finding Ciri? Sounds like an awful lot of searching, but I do wish you luck. Elix instead goes for the equally cliché premise of a revenge story. There's still a cataclysmic threat lurking in the background, which eventually becomes part of the main quest, but it's not presented as the main focus of the story. It's something that could happen, not will imminently happen. Rather, the story is about the main character, Jax, trying to regain his lost strength after he's betrayed by his former comrades, so that he can learn why they betrayed him and ultimately so that he can get revenge on them for trying to kill him and leaving him for dead. So when the player spends dozens of hours ignoring the main quest in favor of exploring the world and doing random side quests for people who should be totally inconsequential to the outcome of the main story, it actually makes sense, especially considering the game's insanely tough difficulty. I'm here in enemy territory. What was Kallax doing here so far from Zaykor? If I want answers, I need to find him. And, for that, I'll need weapons and equipment. It's all part of regaining his lost strength, and there's no pressing need to act quickly to stop the bad guys from doing anything, thus keeping the gameplay from being at odds with the story and vice versa. But as the Elix has drained from your body, so has your power. You will have to find other ways to acquire strength. You cannot reverse that process now. You have changed, Jax. You must accept that change. The free people face destruction at the hands of the Alps and they are now your only chance of survival. You must learn their skills and perfect them if you or they are to survive. I think your fate is now tied to theirs. The most interesting thing about Elix's story isn't actually the main story itself, but rather its lore and backstory. Whereas Skyrim and The Witcher 3 both feel like relatively generic takes on traditional fantasy settings, Elix feels like something almost completely new and original with its blend of fantasy, science fiction, and post-apocalypse themes. That combination shouldn't really work, but it does thanks to a genuinely interesting premise and effective world building. I, for one, found it fascinating learning about what the world was like before the comet, how the survivors adapted after the comet, how the world split into its three primary factions, how each faction uses Elix for its own goals, and so on. I normally don't like it when games resort to fleshing out their lore by strewing audio logs and journal pages around the world. All three games do this to an extent. But Elix was a rare case where I actually enjoyed reading and listening to nearly everything I came across, in large part because of the huge variety of snippets you can find from all different time periods in multiple types of media and formats, nearly all of which relate directly to the game's central premise. I never read a single one of the history and lore books in Skyrim because the world itself never felt that interesting for me to want to seek out supplemental material to understand it better. The Witcher 3 was better in this regard, but felt like a lot of the in-game literature was there just to fill in the gaps for players who hadn't read the novels upon which the game series is based. A lot of it was in one ear out the other for me, because it didn't have much practical effect on my interaction with the world or gameplay, and rarely felt necessary to understand or appreciate the setting. 
With Elix, the setting is practically a character in and of itself, with its own plot arc and twist revelations as you uncover more of its history through in-game media. There's a pretty major subplot, for instance, about infinite skies and Kalan, the cleric's god, that you piece together entirely on your own through dozens of text entries and journals, solving a mystery sort of like an anthropological researcher. You're not just being told a story in this case, you're discovering it yourself, thus lending a more active, player-driven aspect to the environmental storytelling. In fairness, The Witcher 3 has some really strong storytelling elements, and in fact, I'd say its narrative presentation is probably its strongest asset and the thing that makes it worth playing. It has tons of compelling stories with interesting characters depicted with top-notch production quality. Many of its side quests have better storytelling than some entire game's main stories, but I'll still maintain that the pacing of the main story suffers due to its incongruity with the open-world gameplay formula, which Elix balances a little better, and I found the backstory much more fascinating to learn about in Elix than in The Witcher 3 or Skyrim. To be abundantly clear, Elix is not a perfect game. In typical Piranha Bytes fashion, it feels a little undercooked, as if another six months of development time could have elevated it from a fairly good game with some problems to an all-around great game. Some ideas feel poorly thought out and awkwardly implemented, while certain kinks and hiccups can leave some mechanical systems feeling a little unpolished. Low production value relative to other $50 or $60 games combined with a mediocre presentation, a dry main character, a clunky combat system, and a brutally tough difficulty curve will be enough to turn some people off within the first hour. To me, none of the game's problems are strong enough to detract from the overall experience, even though some of them seriously annoyed me and others are completely inexcusable. Some of the game's so-called problems aren't even problems as far as I'm concerned, with a bunch of mainstream criticism seeming utterly misguided and unfounded, disparaging comments made by people who never understood the game's intentions and who never bothered to learn its systems. The reason I'm so high on Elix, despite its apparent issues, is because it's an open-world action-adventure RPG that values mechanical depth and player agency over things like presentation and accessibility. This is a game that doesn't hold your hand. What you do in the world matters, and it takes actual thought, effort, and time to master its systems and overcome its challenges, thereby making it a deeply engaging and rewarding experience. And what it does well, it does extremely well. The world is huge while still offering a ton of depth and rewarding exploration, the quests have a lot of great choices and consequences that can have a dramatic effect on the world, the combat demands precise timing and positioning while managing stamina and your combo meter, the progression system uses fixed enemies and hand-placed items to create a very specific difficulty curve that's genuinely challenging and therefore rewarding when you level up and get stronger, and the story has a lot of intriguing elements in terms of the world and backstory. In the grand scheme of things, Elix is better than the sum of its parts, but even on an individual level it does a lot of important things better than Skyrim and The Witcher 3, which is especially impressive because it was made by a much smaller team on a much smaller budget. I played Skyrim and The Witcher 3 for about 130 hours each and was glad to finally be done with each of them upon completing them. I may never feel the urge to play either one ever again. I played Elix for 100 hours and then immediately launched a second playthrough, and upon completing that, I immediately launched a third playthrough. I could even see myself wanting to replay it again in another 5 or 10 years. This was seriously one of the most satisfying, most engrossing game experiences I've had in a long time, and as a long fan of Piranha Bytes who's been disappointed with or underwhelmed by everything they've put out in the last 15 years, this feels like the best game they've made since Gothic 2, and that's reason enough to celebrate. If you're not familiar with Piranha Bytes' previous games, then you should know that Elix is in the same category as industry heavyweights like Skyrim and The Witcher 3 in terms of genre and overall value for the amount of content you get with it, but it has a whole lot more heart and soul in exchange for not having the same AAA polish. If you can put up with a lower budget game with some janky rough edges, and especially if you value actual gameplay and mechanical depth over presentation, then Elix is definitely worth your time and money. And with Elix 2 just on the horizon, now's the perfect time to jump in and play the first game in preparation for the sequel, which we can only hope will retain all the same charming elements of the original game while cleaning up some of its rougher edges, thus providing an even better overall experience.